translation <laughs> smack. So tonight's event is part of the Festival des Cinquantinants, which is a three-day extravaganza co-organized by New York University's Center for French Language and Cultures with the Met, the Vitrine of All Things French at NYU, and also by the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie. And uh, I'm going to be very, very brief, but I do want to say uh, a special thank you to our extra sponsors this year, uh, including the Consulat General de Suisse à New York, uh, la Délégation Générale du Québec à New York, and uh, Wallonie Bruxelles International à New York. So uh, our moderator uh, and host this evening uh, is uh, Claire Reisning, who is a graduate student in the Department of French Language, uh, Thought, and Culture at NYU. And I'm going to leave it to uh, Claire uh, to thank uh, and to introduce our participants today. Um, but I will already say to them a huge thank you for being here and for taking part in this. Uh, very exciting uh, and uh, uh, tough. Uh, redefining events. So, Claire. So, thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. And uh, here we go. Thank you very much, Paul. And before we begin, I also want to thank our host, the American Poets Cafe, and our writers and our translators for sharing their time and talent with us today. And finally, we do a round of applause for Guillaume Perry for the months of hard work and organizing the festival. And here, the idea is not to compete as in a poetry slam, but to infuse translation with the spontaneity, the performance, and the pressure of a slam environment. And this event shows us what a translator can create with time constraints. And comparing the different translations, which we'll do tonight, highlights the different interpretations that can arise even from a short class. So our translators, Janet and Andrew, had only just over a week prepare their texts, and they did not consult each other in their interpretations. So what you'll see today is a draft of their translation that reveals their initial impressions and interpretations. And for this event tonight, we'll have two parts. Um, first, we'll hear from our first two writers, um, Gabrielle and Fabienne, and we'll hear from the translations from Janet and Andrew. And then in the second half, um, to keep everyone on their toes, our second two writers, um, Madeleine and Arthur, will read their texts, and we'll select a selected, uh, a short extra of, of their text for the public to translate. So you will all get to try your hand at translation. So this will be our open mic session of the slam. And the theme uniting all of these readings tonight is comment dire no how to say no. And all of these texts tell um, stories of resistance and subversion on a thematic level. And on a technical level, they also give us the occasion uh, to reflect on the resistance of the writer's work to comprehension and translation into another language, which we'll talk about at the end of the discussion. So to begin with Saya, um, we have the pleasure of welcoming Gabrielle Marcus Adlet, who is hidden behind the screen a little bit. Uh, who is a writer and teacher of literature from Quebec. And he is the author of three novels, as well as uh, novellas and poetry. And his novel, Pas de Roche, won the Prix de Rundé and the Prix Cavalier de Pompomonie in 2016. And Gabrielle will read an excerpt from his latest work, which is a remake of a 1918 novel, La Scumine, by Albert Laberge. And this novel criticized uh, peasant traditions and the authority of the Catholic Church in rural Quebec, focusing on an outcast peasant woman. And translating um, Gabrielle, we have Janet Lee and, um, and Andrew and Stone. And Janet holds an MA in literary translation from NYU. And her interests in translation and research include hypertext, travel narrative, and experimental genre. She is currently translating the work C by author Alain Hudson. And Janet is the founder of Another Way to Say, a translator's reading series, and she works in foreign rights at St. Martin's Press. And Andrew is a PhD student in French literature at NYU. And he has previously worked as a commercial translator as well as an English language teacher in the United States and in France. 
His current research interests include 18th century theories of language, historiography, theater, and racial categorization. à tous ceux qui sont présents aujourd'hui. Euh, je trouve ça intéressant de lire un extrait de, de Lasquin, mon dernier roman, parce que tu l'offrir à la traduction, puisque c'est un roman qui est lui-même, d'une certaine façon, une traduction, une adaptation, un remake d'une œuvre qui a eu 100 ans l'année dernière, parce que c'est un roman qui a un an et 100 ans à la fois. Je vous lis aujourd'hui le chapitre 21. Lasquin sent le rose lui montrer, lui monter au joues. Lasquin, dit le surnom du personnage principal. Jamais un homme ne lui a adressé la parole de cette façon. Gloussant comme une poule, elle triture le tissu de sa jupe et se dandine d'un pied sur l'autre, à la fois excitée et intimidée. Il faut dire que l'inconnu a du bagout et qu'elle n'a eu qu'à lui souhaiter le bonjour pour qu'il entame joyeusement la conversation. Ayant pris l'habitude de fouiner chez les voisins, elle est tombée par hasard sur Facette, le garçon ferme, qui se barbifiait en compagnie d'un gars du canal venu acheter une charge de foin. À faire des pleins d'entrain, le visiteur lui donne du mademoiselle et lui fait des belles façons, sans se départir d'un air taquin qui la désarçonne au plus haut point. « Vous rasez-vous des fois? » demande-t-il soudain. « Ah, pour ça non, » répond l'esprit en riant. « Je laisse ça aux hommes, qu'est-ce que vous pensez? »« Pourtant, vous avez là quelques beaux poils au menton, » souligne le garçon. « Ouais, tu devrais te faire la barbe de temps en temps, » grand chéri facette, sourire en coin. En effet, tandis que les hanches de sa sœur s'élargissent et que ses seins gonflent déjà son tablier, la squine se voit pour sa part embarrassée d'une carrure et d'une pilosité de garçon. « Je pourrais te la faire, moi, » propose l'inconnu. « Ah ouais, la squine, » insiste son compagnon en riant, « on a déjà le rasoir et tout le fourniment. » La jeune fille hésite. Elle n'est pas sûre d'aimer la tournure des événements, mais à peine a-t-elle fait mine de reculer que l'inconnu la saisit par un bras. « Lâchez-moi !» hurla la squine en se débattant. Mais il est trop tard. Trop tard pour tourner les talons. Trop tard, surtout, pour éteindre l'étincelle allumée dans l'œil des garçons. Trahi par ses envies, floué par sa propre ingénuité, la squine voudrait les frapper, les voir anéantis. Mais la mousse blanche et tiède dont Facette lui couvre joyeusement les joues et le menton coule le long de sa gorge et lui chatouille le cou. Incapable de lutter, la jeune fille se tortille, glousse et gémit avant d'éclater d'un incontrôlable fou rire. Humiliée, pleurant de rage et de dépit, la squine songe à Charlot, qui cette fois ne la sauvera pas. Elle pourrait l'appeler, dans la débâcle de ses résistances, hurler à s'en déchirer des poumons le nom de son frère adoré. Mais ce serait en vain, la squine le sait bien. Errant solitaire sur des chemins qui n'appartiennent qu'à lui, Charlot n'entend même plus ses cris. to her cheeks. A man has never addressed her this way before. She fusses with the fabric of her skirt, giggling like a hen, and shifts from side to side, at once intimidated and excited. It must be said that the stranger has an easy way of talking, and that she only needed say hello for him to gaily start up a conversation. Having taken to poking around the neighbors, she'd randomly come upon Fassette, the farm boy, who was shaving with a lad from the canal there to buy a load of hay. The guest calls her again and again Mademoiselle and is gracious to her, all the while seemingly taunting her in a way that is most unsettling. Do you ever shave, Mademoiselle? he asked suddenly. Why well, should say not, Scamp replied laughing. I leave that to the men, of course. And yet you have several handsome hairs on your chin there, the boy indicates. Yeah, you have to be shaving every now and then, Facet adds, smirking. Indeed, while her sister's hips grew wider and her breast filled out her apron already, Scamp, meanwhile, was clearly afflicted with the boy's frame and scruff. I could give you one, the stranger offers. Come on, Scamp, his partner insists laughing. We have the razor and the whole kit right here. The young girl hesitates. She isn't sure she likes where things have turned. 
but the moment she makes as if to go, the stranger grabs her arm. Let me go, Scamp shouts, struggling. But it's too late, too late to turn heel, too late especially to put out the glints gleaming in the boy's eyes. Betrayed by her desires, duped by her own naivete, Scamp would like to hit them, see them destroyed, but the warm and white cream that Bassett gayfully, um, gayfully covers all over her cheeks and chin runs down the length of her throat and tickles her neck. Unable to fight them, the young girl squirms, giggles, and moans before breaking out in uncontrollable wild laughter. Humiliated, crying with rage and despair, Scamp's mind turns to Charlot, who this time will not save her. She could call out to him as her struggles weaken, shout the name of her dear brother until her lungs tear apart, but nothing would come of it. Scamp knew it. Wandering alone along the path that belonged to him and him alone, Charlotte doesn't even hear his pain. Green feels the pink rise in her cheeks. Never had a man spoken to her that way. Chucking like a chicken, she fiddles with the fabric on her skirt and waddles from one foot to the other, both excited and intimidated. The stranger has a, has a smooth tongue, it must be said, and all she has to do is say hello to him and he would joyfully leap into conversation. Because she has taken up the habit of poking around the neighboring houses, she stumbles into Facet, the farm boy, who was shaving his beard with a boy from the canal, who has come to buy a bundle of hay. Friendly and spirited, the visitor addresses her as Miss, while strutting about, never straying from the teas. It all leaves the screen absolutely baffled. Miss, do you ever shave? He asks suddenly. Oh, of course not, the screen answers laughing. I'll leave that to me, what do you think? But you have a few fine hairs there on your chin, the boy points out. With a smirk, I said goes even further, yeah, you gotta shave your beard from time to time. Indeed, while her sister's hips were getting wider and her bosoms already filling up her apron, the screen found herself embarrassed by her lawyer's stature and hairiness. Me, I could do it for you, the, stran the stranger offers. Ah, oh, come on, screen, the boys insist. We already got the razor and all we need. The young lady hesitates. She does not know if she likes this new turn of events. But she hardly seems to back away when suddenly the stranger grabs her arm. Let me go, the screen screams, struggling to free herself. But it's too late. Too late to turn around and walk away. Too late, especially, to extinguish the spark burning in their eyes. Betrayed by her own fancies, due by her own gullibility, the screen would like to hit them, to see them ruined. But the white lukewarm cream in, in, her, in which Placette joyfully covers her cheeks and chin begins to run down her throat and tickle her neck. Unable to fight it, the young lady wiggles, chuckles, and wails before bursting into an uncontrollable mad laughter. Humiliated, crying in rage and resentment, the screen thinks about Shalom, who will not save her this time. She will call out to him in, the, in all the chaos of her resistance, scream out her dear brother's name until she tears her lungs. But it will be in vain. The screen knew that much. Roaming alone on roads that only he occupies, Shalom does not even hear her cries. some transportation uh, problems right now. So I think what we'll do instead when we're waiting is um, I have a few questions uh, that are just uh, for, for Gabrielle and for the translation of Gabrielle's text. And uh, we can have a, a short Q&A before moving on to the second part if, um, if our second writer, Fabienne, is still out here. So um, to start out, so I had one question about a translation choice that um, that you both had was and that was translating um, Rasquin's name. And since Dan, I, you decided to translate it, and you, um, I know you had a couple different translations in mind before you picked your final one. And then Andrew, you decided to keep the original name Rasquin. And um, I was wondering if you could explain your choices, whether or not to translate the title of the character's name. And um, you guys would explain why. And then Gabriela, I was wondering also what um, what you thought about these choices and what you think is 
closest to what you had in mind by naming Vaseline. Actually, before you start, would you would you mind explaining um, the origins of the, of the name Vaseline and um, how and um, what what this name signifies for the character? I can give you a actually. C'est une question, c'est une question piège à répondre en fait parce que la Squid, c'est pas moi qui ai inventé ce nom-là. Le roman étant un remake d'un roman de 1918 qui s'appelait déjà la Squid. Le personnage principal s'appelle la Squid et dans le roman original, comme dans le mien, c'est un nom qui lui est donné un surnom en fait. Elle s'appelle Polima, cette jeune fille-là. Et elle va être appelée la Squid par ses camarades d'école. C'est une petite fille dans le roman original qui, qui est très désagréable, qui est méchante, qui est laide. Dans mon roman, moi, je vais garder cette, euh, je vais Je vais explorer son évolution. Je vais, je, vais, je vais essayer de voir comment on peut devenir un être désagréable et méchant quand on est une petite fille comme les autres, finalement, qui veut juste l'amour et l'attention. Donc, c'est un surnom qui lui est donné. Et dans le roman original, on dit que c'est un nom qui, qui, un nom sans signification venu des abysses du langage, finalement. Il n'y a pas vraiment d'explication pourquoi ces sonorités-là. Puis là, en entrevue, par des, des, des lectures interposées, euh, l'auteur aurait dit que a, ça dériverait peut-être de l'anglais « sconce », de la moufette en français, l'animal, qui, parce qu'à cause de son odeur, parce que c'est une petite fille qui traîne toujours une odeur d'urine avec elle, parce qu'elle fait pipi au lit. Donc, ce serait l'explication, mais ce n'est pas, pas une explication claire. Fait que moi, je le, je le conserve avec son espèce d'aura mystère de donner à des, à des traducteurs, c'est un peu leur, leur, leur transférer le, le fardeau de trouver du sens ou non dans, dans, dans le nom. Je n'ai pas de réponse claire, il faut venir à tout ça. Merci. Ah, donc, avec cette expression, est-ce que, Alain, vous avez des questions Pourquoi tu as choisi le nom que tu as choisi et pourquoi tu as choisi de, de traduire le nom de Vasily? So, scamp in, in English, I think, works specifically for this, um, for this part of her life. Because she is still young, I think that I would have needed much more time to translate it as she grows up and um, the name wouldn't quite fit anymore. Where right now she's kind of this... Um, this tomboyish, um, supposedly cruel, um, hard to handle child at school. It makes a little sense. It makes sense with the scamp, and I like the sound of um, SC, scamp, as theme. Um, but it's also something that, yeah, would just work for this particular extract. I thought of messy. I thought of stinky thing. I thought of. Um, I thought of stink, which sounded too much like skink, so I, I passed on that. Um, and, and then, of course, I just thought maybe I should just keep the screen because there's nothing that sounds like that. There's something just really um, wonderful about the way that that leaves your mouth when you're saying it almost, you know, in a very, like, insulting way, and somehow it's still very pretty. Um, anyway, it was, it was a lot. It was a debate, and I think in the end I, I liked the challenge more than the result because I still like I still like the screen better than the scam. Good, thank you. And Andrew, um, how did you decide to keep the, the original name and, and not? Thank you, Claire. Oh, um, um, it wasn't a really lazy decision to keep uh, sc the screen, but um, I chose to keep it just because. I mean, at a given moment in the text, I thought the original language should speak out, and also I was aware of the origins, as Gabriel uh, explained, the origins of Scream, it's sort of a corruption of skunk, perhaps. And I decided, so I decided to keep the, the name, and um, it would sort of be a, a challenge, more so to the reader, to the English-speaking reader, to, to be exposed to, uh, to uh, the language, the original language of the text, and not just um, the language as I presented it, and that's why I kept the screen, just to keep the original text there. Thank you. All right, so we, since um, we are waiting for our second writer, what I'm going to do now is, if we could skip ahead on the PowerPoint to uh, Madeleine's text, and I will explain, uh, since the, we'll skip ahead to, the, to the, what we had with the second half, and then if we have time at the end, we will come back to 
the second text by Fabienne Candor. And so this, it will be um, how, you know, how a poetry slam has an open mic portion. This will be kind of the open mic portion of the translation slam, and where everyone in the audience will have a chance to translate. So first, um, Madeleine Monette and Arthur Bouguer will read their work um, in French. And I've isolated on the screen uh, a part of each text um, in that you, as the audience members, uh, will pick one text and have time to translate. You'll have about 15 minutes or so to translate this portion of the text. So you'll get a, a little taste of what Janet and Andrew have been doing for the past week. And any brave volunteers then can come up and read their translations um, to the audience. And if there are no volunteers, uh, I, we have prepared translations of those texts as well that um, are on the screen and we can read, but I'd like to see what you, what you are all able to do. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Madeleine Monet, um, if you would please stand, thank you, um, who is... And Madeleine is from Montreal and now lives in New York. And she is the author of uh, several novels, poetry collections, and novellas. And she's been nominated for literary prizes in Quebec, France, and the US. And she has been a member of the Académie des Lettres du Québec since 2007. And Madeleine's most recent publication, La Mer au Feu, A Sea Fire, was written after Hurricane Sandy, and this text also includes engravings by the French artist uh, Veronique de Guitar. And Madeleine will now introduce and read an excerpt from her 2015 novel, Skate Park. Thank you, Madeleine. Merci beaucoup, Claire. C'est formidable d'être ici. Thank you all for being here on this beautiful day. Um, I will indeed read an excerpt from this novel, Skate Park which uh, came out in Paris in 2015, but had come out first in uh, Quebec under the title Les Rouleurs. And of course, coming out in France, they had to make it a more French title, Skate Park. <laughs> so, dans Skate Park, un garçon oublie son sac à dos dans une voiture de métro tard un soir. Ariel aimerait retrouver l'enfant d'une douzaine d'années pour lui remettre son sac. Mais l'étiquette d'identité est usée et presque illisible. Dans un paysage urbain, un lien s'établit peu à peu entre Ariel et ce petit évadé à mi-temps de la banlieue, mordu de rap et de rouleurs extrêmes, en passe de devenir un enfant des rues. Dans l'extrait qui suit, Ariel écoute un CD qui se trouvait dans le sac à dos du garçon et qu'elle a d'abord cru vierge parce qu'il n'avait pas d'étiquette. J'ai intitulé cet extrait plus apaisant que du lait chaud. Dès les premiers sons du rap, Ariel reconnaît l'un des textes qu'elle a trouvé dans le sac à dos du petit chaliot, récité à cappella. La bouche du garçon étreint les mots. Il n'en sort qu'un murmure rageur, comme si l'enfant restait enfermé en lui-même, le pouce serré sur les sons qui le traversent. Des sujets empruntés et des clichés sur les mots de la société s'entassent à bâton rompu, sans même le bénéfice d'un leitmotiv ou d'un refrain auquel se cramponner. La solitude est mon amplitude, sale plainte de la dernière longitude, l'école, l'enrigiment de la multitude. Moi, je poque par cœur sur ma péninsule, gare à l'autorité qui te bouffe, qu'elle mouche la pique sur ses pics d'autodafé. L'argent est l'océan de la pauvreté. Pas de pitié pour mes vieux rouleurs usés. À minuit, les lampes de poche en feu font la chasse aux riders contagieux. Jackass insomniaque, je ne respire pas mieux dans les jardins frileux des maniaques. La loi est un opium démoniaque qui s'attaque aux squatteurs sans avenir. Plutôt crever sous les balles que de m'avachir à loisir. L'âge adulte est obèse et toxique. La musique m'immunise en intraveineuse. C'est ma rivière biologique, ma sève rouge fluo en veilleuse. To rap is to flow, rappers on the run, to rap is to know. Tandis que des passages entiers échappent à Ariel, trop rapide ou assourdi, elle se demande si c'est vraiment ce qu'est un auto d'affait et s'il ne répète pas des lieux communs du monde hip-hop. Puis elle se dit 
qu'à son âge, il serait normal qu'il soit plus profane que profond, qu'il n'ait pas prise sur toutes les pensées qui le séduisent, ni sur tous les mots qu'il s'approprie. D'ailleurs, personne ne lui demande de faire des sonnets, même si le rap est un genre lourd de mots, un point inespéré vers la poésie. Toutefois, il est regrettable qu'il ne se mette pas davantage en scène, qu'il ne fabrique pas de petits reportages hard à la façon de tant de rappeurs branchés sur leur vie en direct. Car Ariel voudrait bien confirmer l'idée qu'elle se fait de lui. Consterné par ses propos trop précoces et violents sur les femmes, sur les bitches qui se font les dents sur son flic et quoi encore, elle ne s'arrête pas à ce théâtre. Habituée aux insultes rituelles du rap, elle se concentre sur cette manière de poème piégé dans une cadence, sur ce collage d'effets sonores qui a l'intensité de la ville. Ce qui l'interpelle, c'est en grande partie ce lyrisme qui broie du noir, qui se campe entre nonchalance et virulence pour refuser la clarté des autres. C'est cette fierté de lion qui bat de la patte en rugissant sous le fouet. Alors ce garçon, prêt à assumer son drame avec l'arrogance des grands, Ariel s'en découvre un peu plus éprise. Elle l'imagine qui s'endort le soir en se répétant des paroles de chansons comme une prière mécanique, une berceuse interminable qui l'accompagnera jusqu'au réveil. Chaque mot rude, plus délicieusement brûlant qu'une lampée d'alcool ou plus apaisant que du léger. And our next presentation is by Arthur Hubert, who at age 27 has already published um, two books and several works of short fiction. And his first novel, L'Oeil de l'Espadon, received Switzerland's Prix Bibliomedia and has been translated into Italian and German. And today he will be translated into English. And he is a member of the group Ajar, which creates performances and literary projects and promotes work by young authors. And Arthur has also co-founded the group um, Collectif Erotrope, and he performs with the group Mysterious Traveler. Arthur will be reading a monologue called um, Pourquoi je ne donne pas au pauvre, um, which, which uh, was published in a Swiss anthology for students la liaison littéraire. Thank you, Claire. Hello, everybody. Bonjour, tout le monde. C'est un vrai plaisir d'être là. Merci beaucoup. Je vais effectivement vous lire un, un, un texte au titre un peu provocateur et au contenu peut-être un peu provocateur aussi. Apprendre évidemment euh, au deuxième, voire troisième, voire quatrième, voire cinquième degré à vous de choisir. Sur le chemin du bureau. Il y a un mendiant assis par terre devant la station de métro. Il me regarde et je sais qu'il espère une pièce. Tous les matins, je l'ignore et je passe mon chemin. Le mendiant doit penser que je ne le vois pas, que je suis gêné de ne rien lui donner. Le mendiant se trompe. En fait, il ne pourrait être plus éloigné de la réalité. Je me refuse tout à fait à donner ne serait-ce qu'un centime au mendiant, et je le répète, je n'en démordrai pas. Ce n'est ni une question de principe, ni une question d'honneur, c'est un simple choix rationnel. En fait, c'est le seul choix vraiment sensé qui s'offre à nous. Raisonnons par l'absurde. Si un jour, j'avais la folle idée de donner une pièce au mendiant, ce qui, je le répète, n'arrivera pas, mais, mais si, admettons, je lui donnais une pièce si cette action se répétait plus d'une fois, chaque fois que j'en aurais une dans ma poche ou dans mon porte-monnaie, ce qui est fréquent pour ne pas dire systématique, parce que je suis un homme raisonnable, je ne sors jamais sans avoir de la monnaie sur moi, on ne sait jamais. Comment trouver une méthode irréfutable et parfaitement logique afin de déterminer les jours où il faudrait lui donner une pièce et les jours où il ne faudrait pas si donc cette action, lui donner une pièce, en venait à se reproduire, ce qui est inévitable, puisqu'il n'y a pas de façon adéquate, si ce n'est purement arbitraire, de déterminer les jours de don et les jours de refus. Si donc, 
pour rester cohérent et ne pas me remettre au hasard, j'en venais à lui donner une pièce chaque fois que je le vois. Et si le mendiant se mettait à compter sur cette pièce, s'il en venait à en dépendre, à en prendre des engagements en conséquence, si donc cette pièce instaurait entre nous un rapport de dépendance, pour ainsi dire de promiscuité malsaine, si enfin le fait de lui avoir donné ses pièces poussait irrémédiablement tous les autres travailleurs à lui donner aussi une pièce, parce que rien ne les en empêcherait désormais aucun argument rationnel pour déterminer qui a le plus de légitimité à lui donner une pièce, nous serions donc bien obligés d'admettre que pour qu'il n'y ait pas d'inégalité entre nous, ceux qui travaillent, il faudrait que nous lui en donnions tous une. Si alors toutes les travailleuses et tous les travailleurs, moi y compris, lui donnaient, et si cette action se répétait chaque jour, encore et encore, et c'est inévitable, car comment choisir de donner une pièce un jour et pas lui donner le lendemain sans être profondément hypocrite, ou pire, inconstant Si donc, chaque jour, le mendiant récoltait un nombre de pièces proportionnel au nombre de travailleuses et de travailleurs qui passent devant la station de métro tous les matins, si alors le mendiant, à force de recevoir chaque jour son homme quotidien, serait devenu plus riche et sans même travailler que l'ensemble des travailleuses et des travailleurs, moi compris, et malgré mon, mon salaire de cadre, certes il faudrait du temps, mais on peut nier que la chose est inévitable si l'on considère les différentes conditions énoncées ci-dessus. Si alors le mendiant, en sa qualité de nouveau riche, pouvait vivre enfin libre et indépendant, si enfin il pouvait même, avec le temps, devenir propriétaire, s'il plaçait son argent, ce serait la seule décision raisonnable, jusqu'à n'avoir plus rien d'autre à faire que de devoir couler la flot sur son compte en banque jour après jour. Si alors cette situation se reproduisait sur l'ensemble des mendiants qui peuplent nos rues, car comment déterminer une méthode rationnelle La hiérarchisation de la valeur humaine n'est-elle pas le fondement du fascisme pour définir en quoi un mendiant mériterait davantage de recevoir régulièrement une pièce plutôt qu'un autre Si donc, en l'absence de critères viables d'éligibilité, tous les mendiants devenaient de riches propriétaires fonciers et que la mendicité était tabolie. Si les travailleuses et les travailleurs, moi y compris, de leur avoir tout donné, se retrouvaient sans le sou, car j'ai omis cet aspect des choses, pourtant pas anecdotique, comment déterminer la somme adéquate qu'il convient de donner aux mendiants sans suggérer de façon sous-jacente que l'on est en train d'évaluer sa valeur monétaire, ce qui est tout à fait immoral si pour rester humain et surtout cohérent, nous en venions donc toutes les travailleuses, tous les travailleurs et moi-même à donner à tous les anciens mendiants la totalité de notre argent et de nos biens les plus précieux, si enfin nous leur donnions tout ce qui nous appartient, y compris le temps dont nous disposons, notre ressource la plus précieuse, car il n'y aurait plus aucune façon de déterminer une quelconque limite, alors le monde se retrouverait dirigé par des gens qui ne travaillent pas, mais qui amassent toutes les richesses au profit de ceux qui se crèvent la santé à s'agiter dans tous les sens pour ne rien recevoir. Ainsi, pour éviter cette inconcevable injustice. Jamais je ne commettrai cet acte inévitablement reproductible et lourd de conséquences de donner un jour une pièce aux mendiants assis par terre tous les matins devant la station de métro. What's got into her at the, keep of, at the peak of her book burnings? Money is the ocean of poverty. No pity for my worn out skates. At midnight, my pocket lamp is on, tracking down the writers in the contagion. I'm an insomniac jackass. I don't breathe the better for it. In gardens fearful of maniacs, law is a demonic weapon which attacks squatters with no future. Music has vaccinated me against intravenousness. It's my biological river, my red fluorescent sieve, put on hold. To rap is to flow, rappers on the run, to rap is to know. Thank you. That's very well done for the 15 minutes that you were given. Any volunteers to read um, Arturo's translation? Oh, thank you. Oh, 
everybody. It's really nice to stand up here and not um, be saying something official. <laughs> you know what I mean. <clears throat> so, I'm really a person as well as an administrator. Hard to believe, but. So, um, <clears throat> I, I firmly believe in translation as, as, a, as a space of unpacking, as a space of freedom, as a space of uh, willful errors, as a space of untranslation, right, as Baba Hakesan talked about, and as a space where you can unpack things that aren't actually there. And so, uh, I really enjoyed uh, Achtil's text, and so I'm going to do a, um, something a little different, and I want to underscore that it is not out of disrespect but rather out of the joy of your text and the amount that I enjoyed it uh, when you read it. So uh, there is a pur purposeful mistranslation in this. Um, it is not an error, uh, so to speak, but um, there we go. So here we go. <clears throat> if one day I had the nutty idea to put on a play for the beggar, which I won't, but if, for argument's sake, I did put on a play for him, if this action happened more than once, each time I had a play in my pocket or in my purse, as I often do, indeed, it's systematic because I'm a man of reason. I never leave home without being an instrument of change. How can one find an irrefutable and perfectly logical method for determining on what days I should put on a play for him and on which days I would not put on a play for him? If this action, putting on a play for him, were to be repeated, which is an inevitable, there is no adequate method. It is completely arbitrary. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, in the discussion section, I'd be interested in hearing how you chose put on a play. I was like, if yes, ah, yes, yes. But how or I guess what made you make that decision? So yes, thank you. And um, <laughs> and any other volunteers? If not, we have about an hour left, and so we, get, we have time now to um, listen to Fabienne's text as well as the two translations um, that were prepared for, um, for Fabienne's text. Before um, Fabienne begins, I would just like to introduce her. So our final speaker, Fabienne Canor, has led a prolific career as a novelist, a translator, documentary filmmaker, and performer, and she is a professor at Penn State University. And Fabienne has received several prizes for her work and was named a Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres by the French Ministry of Culture. And themes throughout her work include cultural alienation, immigration, memory, and gender construction in the Caribbean and West Africa. And Fabienne uh, is generously sharing with us tonight an excerpt from her forthcoming novel that hasn't been published yet, um, The Vieux Monde, which is a story of a man from Cameroon dealing with questions of race in Louisiana. Thank you, Fabienne. Merci, bonsoir, and good evening. So this is a part of the novel. I guess that uh, it might be the end, basically, of the novel called, uh, entitled, Le Vieux Monde. Le pick-up a canné. Zach a coupé le moteur, puis a jeté un coup d'œil sur sa montre avant de descendre. Je n'ai pas bougé. Je suis resté assis à la place du mort Et j'ai regardé Isaac dans le rétroviseur, je l'ai vu qui marchait en direction des cognes. Il s'avançait mollo, pas pressé, tranquille, lui, d'ordinaire intenable, marchait comme s'il avait toute la route et le droit pour lui. Et le calme stupéfiant qui habitait son corps et donnait à la scène une tournure irréelle agissait sur les flics, impuissants à appréhender l'individu de sexe masculin, taille moyenne, à peau noire et en costume qui se rapprochait si tranquillement doux. Drôle de costume, qui avait appartenu à l'ancêtre de Jiri, Ringard, 
ça c'est vrai. Et surtout trop large, vu le châssis de Zach. En le voyant l'enfiler ce matin, j'avais lâché. On ne porte pas les habits d'un mort. Zach avait raccourci l'ourlet de la veste au scotch et fait couler une ceinture dans les passants du pantalon. J'aurais dû m'expliquer. On ne met pas les habits d'un mort parce que cela porte malheur. Mais il fallait être de là-bas pour y croire. Il fallait avoir couché en brousse, savoir qu'un boa n'est pas qu'un boa et qu'on peut gâter un homme avec les moustaches d'un chat. J'avais désappris ces superstitions, mais ce matin, dans la maison de Jerry, ce matin, jour de départ, tous les usages, toutes les frayeurs de l'autre vieux monde m'étaient revenues. Ne pas emprunter les affaires d'un disparu, ne rien manger, rien boire chez les gens, ne jamais laisser sa sueur, ses urines, ses cheveux, sa salive, ses caleçons et ses ronures d'ongles derrière soi. Parce que je ne savais pas quoi faire de mes mains, j'ai posé ma peau, ma plat sur mon cœur. Mon passeport et mon portable se trouvaient chez Jerry. Je n'avais que quelques dollars en poche et aucune idée pour nous tirer de là. Je n'avais que ce cœur qui marchait fort et mes yeux sur Zach, qui n'était plus Zach d'ailleurs, mais un costume vu de dos qui lui faisait un derrière de grand-père et des jambes en spaghetti, à force que le pantalon était long et mangeait la terre. Calé dans le pick-up où j'avais été heureux, je regardais le costume se remuer. C'était un vieil habit avec des auréoles de sueur sous les bras et les traces d'une lessive bon marché qui coûte cher au final, puisqu'elle l'avait mal et que les taches étaient restées. Cinquante ans plus tôt, quelqu'un s'était marié avec, quelqu'un s'était senti élégant dedans et il avait fait teinter ses talons en s'avançant coquettement vers l'autel. Il avait crâné en remontant le col de la veste. Il s'était glorifié ma case, ma femme et mon costume. Et il était mort comme tout le monde. Soudain, Il m'a semblé que Zach baissait les bras pour retrousser ses manches. C'est ce qu'il a fait pour de bon avant de reprendre. Nous sommes des pharaons. Nous sommes éternels. Nous sommes des pharaons. Nous sommes éternels. C'était déclamé avec une cadence entraînante. À mon tour, voilà que je fredonnais entre mes dents cette chanson qui tombait carrément bien sur cette portion d'autoroute où deux flics étaient venus accomplir leur besogne, appliquer la loi soi-disant. Quand c'est perpétuer la coutume, seulement qu'il perpétuait la coutume. Ils ont repris leur mégaphone pour ordonner à Zach de rentrer sa voix dans sa bouche. Un mot, un geste de plus, et il tirerait. Zach. Zach a levé la tête vers le soleil, et comme pour l'aspirer, pour en pomper la grâce, il a mis ses mains en forme de coupe et les a levées. Oh Oh que son pantalon retrouve l'allure d'un pantalon. Il paraissait un champion, la tête dans les lumières, ses pieds qui dansaient, comme un marié, un arabe qui fête, un paysan face à sa récolte, comme une foule qui voit Dieu, Zach a dansé. À telle ou telle danse, mais une espèce qui n'avait pas de nom parce qu'elle venait de tous ces coins où la peine et l'espoir ont été à la colle, dans le cul des forts des côtes, sur le dos des vaisseaux, dans les quartiers taudis d'esclaves, des hommes et des femmes avaient dansé ainsi. Et c'était demeuré dans les corps cette possibilité de résistance. Zach 
dans ses blouses, Juba, quadrille, Gungut, Groca, Second Line, Bulerengue, Maloya, Funk, Mepol, Cumbia, Palo de Mayo, Hip Hop, Lave Maria. Car il y avait des prières dans sa danse. De la magie, appelons-la plutôt qu'un bois, Juju Vaudou, ça venait par les pieds, puis le son se ruait dans les jambes, les doigts chantaient, le bassin roulait. Ça couvrait des siècles et tant d'endroits dans le monde. Ça réjouissait à en moqueter, à en mouiller sa culotte. Tant de force, tant d'insolence. Nous avions survécu, nous étions là, beaux, habillés, debout, orgueilleux, dangereux. Et nous disions, tu moi, m'en fous. Je suis éternelle. Tu moi, m'en fous, je suis éternelle et je t'emmerde, merde. C'est ce qu'il chantait, en tout cas, Zach, malgré les trous dans son pantalon et sa veste dégoûtante de sang. C'était sa chanson, tandis que les deux policiers tiraient comme des malades, des malades mentaux, des chiens de malades mentaux, des blancs, même si l'un d'entre eux était de la même couleur que nous-mêmes, tiraient et retirer pour être certain que le corps entraîné à ne pas tomber tomberait enfin. Bon sang, quelle lutte, cette danse. Comment continuer à la décrire Now we will have um, translations by Janet and by Andrew um, with a slightly shorter version of the text. Do you want to start us off, Janet The pickup shuddered to a stop. Zach cut the engine, then glanced at his watch before getting out. I didn't move. I stayed in my seat in the passenger side, and I watched Zach in the rearview mirror. I saw his figure walking towards the boys in blue. He walked toward casually, in no hurry, calmly. He, who was usually so edgy, walked as if the road and the right two were all his, and the astounding calm his body held gave the scene a sense of the unreal and had, affected, and had an effect on the cops, powerless to apprehend the male individual of average height, of black skin, dressed in a suit and drawing himself so closely, so calmly to them. It was quite a suit. It had belonged to one of Jerry's ancestors, gaudy thing, it's true, and moreover too large given Zach's frame. When I saw him put it on that morning, I said roughly, we don't wear the dead's clothes. Zach had shortened the hem with scotch tape and ran a belt in, in through the pant loops. I should have gone on to say, we don't put on the dead's clothes because it brings bad luck, but you have to be from over there to believe it. You have to have had slept in the brush to know that a boa isn't just a boa and that you could ruin a man with the whiskers of a cat. I'd left these superstitions behind me, but that morning in Jerry's house, that morning, the day we were leaving, all the old sayings All the phantoms of the other old world came back to me. Do not borrow a den of one's things. Don't eat anything, drink anything in another's home. Never leave behind you your sweat, your urine, your hair, your saliva, your underwear, and your tunnel clippings. Suddenly I thought I saw Zach lowering his arms to roll up his sleeves. He kept his arms lowered and then began singing. We are pharaohs, we are eternal. We are pharaohs, we are, we are eternal. It was chanted with a rousing rhythm. Meanwhile, I, there I was too, sitting, singing low between my teeth, that song that fallen as if from the sky on the section of the highway where two cops had come to carry out their duty, enforce the law, so-called, when it's perpetuation of the culture, only they perpetuated the culture. They lift their megaphone to order Zach to keep his voice in his mouth. One more word, one more move, and they shoot. Zach, Zach lifted his head toward the sun, and as if to breathe it in, to fill himself with the grace of it, he cupped his hands and lifted them high, high enough for his pants to be like pants again. He looked like a champion, his head in the light, his feet dancing. Like a groom, like an air of jubilation, like a farmer at harvest, like a multitude who saw God, Zach danced. 
not some dance or another, but a style that didn't have a name because it came from every corner of the world where pain and hope exist together. In dungeons by the sea, on the backs of ships, in the quarters, slaves hovels, men and women had danced like this, and it endured in the body this possibility of resistance. Zach Dance of Blues, Jumba, Barnyard, Gumbot, Broca, Second Line, Bolrenge, Maloya, Funk, Maple, Kumbaya, Palagumayo, Hip Hop, Ave Maria, for in his dance there were prayers, magic, we'll call it Kimwa, Juju, Voodoo, drawn from the feet, then the sound drummed in his legs, his fingers were seamy, his hips swung round, it encapsulated centuries in so many places in the world, it lifted him, him up to convulsion, to at his trousers, so much power, so much insolence. We survived, we were there, beautiful, dressed, standing, prideful, dangerous, and we were saying, kill me, I don't give a damn, I'm eternal. Kill me, I don't give a damn, and I say, fuck you. Fuck, anyway, this is what he was singing. Zach, despite the holes in his pants, in his jacket, filthy with blood. It was his song, while the two officers were shooting like madmen, like mad in the head, like dogs mad in the head. Even the blanks, if one of them was the same color as ourselves, were shooting and shooting again to be sure that the body, certain not to fall, would fall at last. Damn it, that fight, that dance, how to keep on describing it. broke down. Zach cut the engine off and glanced at his watch before getting help. I didn't move. I stayed there in the dead man's spot and watched Zach through the rear view mirror. I saw him walking toward the policeman. He moved forward very easy, not rushed, calm, usually unruly. He walked as if all the highway and the right of belonged to him. And the astonishing calm that seized his body and turned the scene surreal worked up the cops, unable to apprehend his individual. A black-skinned male of average size, dressed in a suit and approaching them so serene. A knob suit that belonged to one of Jerry's ancestors, quite honestly shabby, and particularly too loose for Zach's figure. Seeing him throw it on this morning, I sped out, You don't wear a dead man's clothes! Zach had taken up the, the, the jacket's hem with tape and slipped the belt through the hoops of his pants. I should have been clearer. You do not wear a dead man's clothes because it's bad luck. We had to be there, we, we had to be from there to believe in it. You had to have slept on a scrub, have known that a boa is not just a boa, and that a man can be spoiled by cat whiskers. I had learned these superstitions, I had unlearned these superstitions. But this morning in Jerry's house, this morning, the day we'd be leaving, all those customs, all the fears of the other old world came back to me. Don't take the deceased man's possessions, don't eat or drink anything at other people's homes. Never let your sweat, urine, hair, saliva, underwear, or toenail clippings behind you. Suddenly I thought, suddenly I thought I saw Zach lower his arms to roll up his sleeves. That's what he did for real, before answering, we are pharaohs, we are eternal. We are pharaohs, we are eternal. It was recited with a stern rhythm. As for me, there I was, humming under my breath, this song that couldn't have come at, at a better time. Here on this part of the highway where two cops had come to complete their task, enforce the law, or supposedly. It's only keeping customs alive when they are the ones keeping the customs alive. They took up their megaphone to order Zach to keep his voice in his mouth. Another word, one more step, and they would fire. Zach. Zach lifted his head toward the sun, and as, and as if breathing it in, milking the grace, he cupped his hands and lifted them high so high that his pants appeared to be pants again. He looked like a champion, his head beneath the light, his dancing feet. Like a groom, a jubilant Arab, a peasant looking upon his harvest, like a crowd beholding God, Zach danced. Not just any dance, but one that, one that did not have a name because it came from all these places where pain and hope had mingled together. In the basements of coastal fortresses, on the backs of ships, in the quarters and clusters of slave shacks, men and women danced that way, and they resided in the body this potential to resist. Zach danced blues, juba, quadrille, gumbu, gruka, 
Second line, blue ring, Maloya, funk, maple, cumbia, probably my hip hop, I'll be real. Because there were there were prayers in, in his dance, magic, what's called crimpa, juju, voodoo, it started in his feet. Then the sound rushed into his legs, his fingers sang, his hips turned. It went through centuries in so many places in the world, where Joseph went to a joke, wetting his pants with it, so much force, so much insolence. We survived, we were there, handsome, well dressed, upright, prideful, dangerous. And we all said together, kill me, whatever, I'm eternal, kill me, whatever, I'm eternal, and fuck you. Fuck, that is what he's saying at least, Zach, despite all the holes in his pants, his jacket dirty with blood. It was his song. All the while, the two officers fired like crazy people, like mentally crazy people, like dogs going mad mental, like white people, even if one of them were the same color as we were, firing and firing to make sure that it, that his, this body, trained not to fall, would finally fall. Goodness, what a fight that dance. How could anyone go on describing it? Janet and Andrew, and it's excellent. And now we have um, about 20 to 30 minutes for a general discussion Q&A, and I would like to invite uh, the other uh, writers back up on stage, we can move the chairs around so we can actually see everyone at the screen. And I have a few questions to start us off, and then it is open to the audience um, for any questions that you might have. So now that we've heard uh, uh, So now that we've heard all of the texts and the translations, I was wondering, first of all, for uh, the two of you, or for anyone who translated in the audience, if uh, there were any passages in particular that were difficult for you to translate that you remember. Um, I have a couple in mind from all of your from all of your texts. If you can't think of something right away, and uh, so where those how those passages resisted translation into English, and what was your thought process in finally choosing a translation? Um, you you had a little more time to think, and you had to make a decision um, right away in how to say this in English. I'll give you a couple minutes to think about it and. Uh, for example, in, in Fabienne's text, um, I think it was on the slide number 17 there, uh, I thought that the, um, uh, the sentence, qu'on sait perpetuer la coutume, seulement qu'il perpetue la coutume, I thought that in particular was a difficult one to, to say in English. I was wondering if you'd want to speak about that or um, any others that came, that came to mind. Um, and in, in Madeleine's text as well, I thought that the rap in particular was difficult to translate. So if you had translated, and also Andrew, I know you had as well. Um, I think I think with um, the last couple of translations, well, there was some there's a that we just read. Um, what what was most difficult for me actually was not a phrase, but getting the rhythm right. Because the narrator has such a unique way of speaking. Um, I felt like I was um, constantly shortchanging the sort of voice that she has. Um, and I, I feel like I eventually recuperated some things, but especially in the beginning, when she's watching him walk away in the rear view mirror, there's something about the way that trips in the French that doesn't quite, that, um, I mean, that was just very difficult for me, those first couple of paragraphs. To add to that, I think um, I was also really struck by the concision, the concision of French uh, when I was reading, uh, when I was reading and translating the text, because there's a certain poetic concision that I'm not for sure English can always capture so even the first line when uh, when uh, when Le Pick Up a Canet 
I feel like it's, it's sort of difficult to say that with such concision in English. Exactly. I mean, um, I, mean I guess there are many ways to say, it, but I think it was that concision, and, and, and also the um, um, there, was, there was also many languages to capture in in, um, in this text, uh, even by the, the same speaker. I mean, on the one hand, it was really poetic, I really because as I thought it was a he. I don't know why. I just assumed he. Oh. Okay. Okay. So when you said at the end, how, how do you continue describing uh, this scene? It was really striking because it, it, it's almost as though we had to resort to poetry to describe this this dramatic and traumatic experience to witness uh, someone close to you be, uh, to be killed. So uh, managing all those languages, and, uh, these memories too, and the histo historical background was uh, was an interesting task. I was wondering if, if you would like to speak to if um, these sentences that were difficult to translate or if there was more of a rhythm to translate, if the English um, changed at all the meaning for you or the, the original meaning that, that you had in writing the text in, in French. Thank you. No, it's a very long trip. Thank you so much, both of you. It's very different. Your work is completely different and unique. So it's uh, difficult for me to grab uh, that one and this one, but they are completely different. We can talk also about that. But the thing is, it really moved me to listen to you because, uh, I mean, my character is a Cameroonian man. So coming from not Cameroon, but France, he spent all his... Uh, young uh, years in Cameroon and then he moved to France at 12 and then at 50 decided to try America and so for me it was a very long process because I tried to creolize his language and so I think that you just mentioned that he doesn't speak uh, the same way but he speaks like, uh, like sometimes Cameroon people speak when they speak French. Mm -hmm. And also because he used to have a lot of friends from the Martinique, Guadeloupe. So he's got something like very Creole in his tongue, actually. And then that tongue, that language, that poetry uh, was transformed when he, when he came to, uh, when he went to uh, New Orleans. Because now he discovered another kind of talk, and you know that New Orleans is very singing. So he can just grab us another kind of poetry. So it's really a mix. So I try to do that, and now it's very, I mean, it's very meaningful because I just, you know, the idea comes from Martinique or Paris, and now you give that poetry back to me. So that's really interesting. And actually, I'm very proud because the thing is, you know, sometimes when you write, you don't, I mean, you're looking for the voice mm -hmm. and you are so afraid of, of doing a mistake, of making many, many mistakes, because sometimes you lose the voice of your characters. And now I just, in the same text, but translated completely differently, I can find again the voice of Nathan mm -hmm. and it starts to grow up. So that's really wonderful. And now that the things that fall, la, la phrase tellement um, uh, perpétuée, la coutume, this is very cruel, yeah. a way of you know, putting the words like a repetition, but not really a repetition. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how to, to do that in mm -hmm. English. I think that maybe you managed to do it, maybe a little more in a way. I could feel like something swinging. Mm -hmm. In, uh, in your English that reminds us the Creole poetry. So, but, but that, that's the thing. I mean, it's very challenging because this tellement and the sonority are completely different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering what you said about the voice of the character. If, um, for you, the how the voice of the character changed when you heard it um, in English, and if you had a different impression of who the character was hearing it in English, especially since the, um, since the, the novel hasn't appeared yet. And, um, yeah, 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 yeah. And the thing is, because um, he decided to move to New Orleans without knowing anything about New Orleans, mm -hmm. and, and so now, you, when I say you give me my character back, it's really good, because we can share that character. And I feel like he's very rooted now in America. So that makes sense. So, yeah, so much sense, thanks to you. Yeah. 
And um, also what you said, Fabienne, about um, about different languages being mixed into the French, about about um, Creole too, that also relates us to um, Gabrielle's text and um, the Quebecois French that you had in the text and how, and I was, I want to hear more about how you decided to um, translate a different type of French into English and whether you decided to make it um, more of a slang or um, I noticed um, Janet used a different spelling of me, um, how and how you went about your decisions of translating the different um, languages of French there. With I feel like with Quebecois, the tendency is to just kind of give it like a southern twang when you're translating it into English because it is kind of the stereotype is more um, country, countryside, um, slower living. There's this definitely idea of um, someone um, who, who sticks to the family and there's, anyway, there's all of that there. So, <laughs> I didn't, I actually didn't want to focus too much on, on the dialect and the way it would sound, perhaps. Um, I wanted, and since it was such a short passage and so much happens, I wanted to focus more on how, at first, he's, he's calling her Mademoiselle. Mm -hmm. and, um, and since you can't say to in an any more, or you in an any more elevated way in English, um, whereas his had a vu. Um, I needed to express that as well before it like kind of devolves very quick, quickly for her and they start call, calling her two and then grabbing her arm and something gets very violent. Um, that was, I think that's my focus there with the dialogue. Yeah. I think um, in terms of trying to capture the Quebecois, it wasn't really an effort because I felt like if I tried to render it in English, it would just come out to something clunky. So as Janet did, I sort of tried to stay away from finding any, any, some type of equivalent di uh, dialect in English. So I, I mean, what, what sort of struck me was sort of the plot itself, sort of the escalation as the, the screen uh, says uh, herself that, or thinks herself that she doesn't really like this turn of events. I mean, this, this sort, of, um, sort of what I... I Hence the translation one was this uh was the, the plot itself and what's happening and uh, and uh, yeah I guess I just took it uh, the, the safe route by not trying to translate the dialect itself but I, I did however um, in, in sentences where there will be uh, some visions or, or something like that I would try to render it similarly in English without falling into the trap of finding an, an equivalent dialect. And also, um, what you were saying uh, about the musicality of text, Fabian's text, that also brings us back to, um, to Madeleine's text in The Rock, where you're writing something musical. And I mean, for Andrew, you also translated this text, and for anyone in the audience who translated, uh, I wanted to ask you if your um, process of translating something musical, something that also that was more image-based, was different from the process that you used from translating a narrative. Um, where there wasn't really a narrative or a plot that you were trying to get across. I don't know if you want to start us off. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, so, thanks. So, uh, the rap was really interesting, and it was really fun to translate the rap because, uh, I mean, because I mean, it is a rap. So I mean, what was difficult was was I mean, a literal translation wasn't really possible, except for certain lines. And so for certain lines, I would take literal trans the literal translation. For example, um, solitude is my amplitude, and and which would give me the literal translation and the rhyme at the end. And from that, I would do a thematic translation afterwards, keeping the rhyme. Um, and that was sort of hard. It was really, I was, I was really, um, I took a lot of liberty uh, in, tr in translating. Yeah. There's no translation. Yeah, thanks. And um, for you who translated it, um on the spot. Do you have anything else to uh, add to what Andrew wants to add? I wanted to ask Andrew about how he handled the Camus Classique or Tique de Cosace because I lost a bit of the alliteration there. There's a lot of alliteration mm -hmm. in yeah. French. Uh, for, for that, I, I didn't try to maintain the alliteration. I just sort of. Um, oh, yeah, I just. 
I changed uh, from, from the one previous to that, it was God Authority, and I changed that to the man, which was a common, it's a cliche as, as Ariel is reflecting on cliches in rap. So I took the man instead of L'Autorité, and uh, I kept, so it goes on to the next line, what's up his ass, but another inquisition. Um, and so for that line, there, there is no alliteration. However, in the other lines, it, I kept, uh, I decided to dis displace that alliteration with internal rhymes. For example, um, uh, I should, when he talks about his rollerblades, it says, um, money is the ocean of poverty. I should use these play, these old blades properly, but come at night, flashlights are like which hunt on those who ride right. And that was, that would go back to that alliteration that was in that initial uh, line that you asked about. And I was wondering if uh, those translations for you, Madeline, changed at all the, any of the meanings that you intended in um, in the original rap, and also um, how I was curious about how you chose the images for um, for this rap too. Yes, um, I cannot answer your first question because I haven't seen those oh, translations, right. oh, and I cannot see them. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and oh, that, that's that's very curious. I mean, yeah. it's very short. I don't know if we could ask them to read it or ask Andrew to to read this. Um, it's it's so short, and maybe we can hear the musicality. And sure. Read it. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. Would you like to read the uh, or just on this on the screen? So I'll read the entire passage. Contrived themes and cliches about the ills of society are heaped together, rambling on without the benefit of any late motif or chorus to cling to. Solitude is my amplitude, sad plant of the last longitude, the masses drafted by curriculum. Off the dome could give a fuck on my peninsula. Watch out, the man will try to swallow you. What's up is asked but another inquisition. Money is the ocean of poverty. I should use these old ways properly, but come at night, flashlights to light, which hunt on those who write right. Jackass can, can hardly breathe up all night. In the shivering guardians of maniacs, the law is a gun for demoniacs. Against featureless squatters, they mount the attack. Music immunizes me dravenously. It's my biologic rhythm, my neon red sap turned low key. It's rappers to flow, rappers on the run, to rappers to know. Do you have a question? I don't know. Is that Proust? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, Les, les Jardins Frilus des Maniacs, it's, uh, it, I think it, a lot of it, um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a poem that is supposed to be, have been written by a, a kid, a 14 year old kid. So, and this kid is, um, does roller skating, uh, extreme roller skating, and he loves rap, and he's, uh, he's starting to become a street kid. So, uh, this, um, I wanted to um, give a sense of his reality and his, uh, his capability to change register in life. I mean, so many of these kids, they, everything, emotions, and the pain is um, is enclosed in their body, and, and it can often explode with physical violence. But this child has the capability to change register, to use words, and also when he does um, the roller skating and goes in skate parks, he's, he's creating his own theater, his own performance too. So he has um, a way of uh, working out the pain. And so, of course, the um, the images um, they, they try to give a sense of his reality when he's in a home, when he's alone at night, and and his relationship to authority, and um, and um, he also goes to libraries. So it's it's a child. Uh, if I had read the longer version of it. Um, uh, says that, you know, he goes to libraries, and, and Ariel knows that, um, and and he also listens to uh, uh, American rappers, but also he listens to um, French philosopher, philosopher rappers like MC Solar, and so, um, so it's a child who has the capability of thinking as well. And Quelle mouche la pique sur ses pics d'autodafé, for example, 
what I think you I heard is her. What you used for la, you used her, and in, in my um, mind, la is refers to authority, which is a, you know, so it's like he's talking about authority, and you know, can mush that be? So, um, but it is true that uh, it becomes very hard to um, carry the rhythm and, uh, and very often when I work with a translator, I tell them um, to start, like my first comments uh, or um, suggestions to them is that I, I would prefer if we don't feel the French it through coming through. Uh, I, I prefer if the language sounds very modern, American or English, or, but uh, and that um, and that we don't feel this as a translation. So, in a in a verb like this, where the language has been worked on even more, I, I really work language very uh, intensely and slowly. And uh, in my novels. Language is often the writing is all, often in the foreground, and it's it's the writing often that makes the action happen. Like you were just saying something almost like this about Fabienne. So we're saying that it's the poetry actually that makes the action happen. And I think that when you work on language um, um, it, as a poet, you, you you're using la fonction poétique du langage. In fact, uh, this can happen, and but then. Uh, in a part like this where suddenly it's poetry. Um, it, of course, the, the work on language becomes even more to the foreground. And um, the idea is uh, also to not betray the character. So I have a, a quick anecdote. There is a, um, the first time I read this, um, there was a poet, a famous poet, from Quebec, who was in the room, and Dorian, and she said to me, Madeleine, you write poetry, you should write poetry. And I said, but this is not my poetry. It's the poetry of a, ch I mean, of, of a character. It's, <laughs> it's fictional. And, you know, so this was also a little bit of a challenge to, uh, to try and work on words the way this child could possibly do. Thank you. And before we open it up to the audience, I had a question for Arthur and uh, the translation by Philip of, of, of Pies. And I was wondering, uh, first of all, what you, what you thought of this um, in kind of intentional uh, mistranslation, if you will, of, of the word that, that intentionally it, it changes, it, um, changes the meaning. And also, if, um, for you, if that made you think differently of kind of the absurdity that you're getting across um, in, this, in this monologue. Yeah, from very great. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, this uh, trans translation and maybe more a transposition mm -hmm. and even a recreation of the text here. And uh, I mean, in in this particular context, I, I found it uh, great. And even I think it's it can also say something about tra translation that it's really a recreation and the creation itself. And um, I think. As a writer, we, we always uh, use uh, materials. Uh, also, uh, we, we didn't write from nothing. We write from our experiences, from our memories, from um, the, the things we see, the, read, the books also we, we read, and that influences um, what we write. And um, it's, it's great if uh, this. I, I also um, think about so, writing as a translation process in any way. And, that was quite kind of a proof of it, uh, I think, in, in some ways. Um, I also had just a question about uh, the transition of the rap, if I, if I may. Um, I, I was interested because uh, the, there was um, English words also in the rap, as a, in French uh, rap, and especially in Quebec, I think there is um, many uh, a mixed mixity of uh, French and English. And um, both of the translations didn't choose to, of course, to, to keep it in English. Um, was this? Was it? Uh, um, do you hesitate on that? Do you, because I, I think we, we may call, for example, choose to change it in another foreign language in order to to um, but the feeling of uh, the the bilingual of the the poem. Was do you do you think of that, for example, or? Was it clear for you that 
no, uh, you will keep it in English because uh, it's, it makes more sense. Um, so, as it concerns the rap, uh, your question was, do, do I keep, uh, do I keep, do I decide to keep the French in there for a reason? I mean, the English part uh, in, in, in the French version, uh, did, you, did you choose to, to keep it or did you think you could maybe uh, transform it in another foreign language? I mean, for example, in French or in Spanish in the English version? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. For, for me. No, 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 it wasn't. It was just, uh, no, it wasn't you at all. Uh, uh, the, the last two parts, I sort of uh, I, I thought about changing it to, to French, but I felt that, I mean, the, the process wouldn't be entirely the same. I mean, just because of the, the influence of English on, on, on this, this rap, uh, this little voice rap. And uh, I mean, the French language doesn't have that same hegemony as the English language in the world. And so it, I just thought it sort of impractical. However, I mean, as a poetic gesture, it would have been interesting to turn into a, I mean, to turn that those final two, uh, two lines into, uh, to, uh, to use a foreign language to bring out those final two lines. However, I just, I mean, given the, the context of the, the, the larger context, I just didn't think it would be the best to see. Thank you. And now we have time for um, two or three questions from the audience before we finish up. Hi. First, uh, I wanted to thank the, everyone on stage, um, the four writers, for their brilliant, brilliant work, uh, principally because there was an element that I love to find and that the translators also found and honored, which is to put us directly in the moment. They were very intimate moments. They were very intimate snapshots for something that are just short extracts. So thank you. That was just exquisite. Um, my question has been partially answered already by the translators, so I wanted to redirect it to the, to the writers, if each of you could answer. When you're writing, uh, two things. A, do you think ahead because you're all bilingual or multilingual? Do you think ahead to other languages to which your work might eventually be translated as you're creating it? Also, when you are writing and having or not having those thoughts, are they literary in your head or are they audio? Do you hear a vocal narrative as we've heard today? Because some people are like, I, I never write to be read. I, read, I write to be read. I never write to be spoken, I write to be read. So when I hear my work, it always freaks me out. So obviously you guys have been around a while and have done this, but do you write with the idea of an audio experience eventually happening? And do you write to more than one language when you create? Si je peux me permettre de répondre, je vais répondre en français et ça va me permettre de répondre à la première question. Je ne suis absolument pas bilingue. Je vous entends, je vous comprends quand vous parlez en anglais, mais euh, si j'ai réussi à me commander une bière au bar, je ça va déjà être un exploit. Je vais être fier de moi. Euh, donc, je ne pense absolument pas. Euh, à, je ne pense pas à cette idée de traduction-là quand j'écris. Euh, et au contraire, je dirais que souvent ce que j'écris, euh, là c'était assez léger dans ce cas-là, mais souvent ce que j'écris peut même être problématique pour des lecteurs francophones qui ne sont pas de chez nous. Parce que j'essaie justement de faire sonner la langue énormément et de ne pas faire sonner le français, une sorte de français universel, mais de faire sonner mon français, le français de la région où j'habite, un français qui... Euh, ben, qui, qui, qui développe sa propre syntaxe, qui mélange du vocabulaire que, que les Français ou les Africains vont, ne vont pas comprendre nécessairement. Et de plus en plus, j'ai tendance à travailler ça pour briser l'idée d'une espèce de langue qui serait hiérarchie avec un Français, disons, parisien au sommet et avec des, 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 des anomalies du Français à mesure qu'on s'éloigne de cette région-là, qu'on s'éloigne dans le temps, pour donner une légitimité à la langue des miens, la langue de chez nous. Fait que je fais justement une espèce de travail, je travaille énormément avec les sonorités, mais j'essaie de laisser le plus de place possible à cette langue-là, quitte à, à briser tes attentes de, du, du, du français d'ailleurs, finalement. Et après, 
je me rends compte que ça peut être très problématique pour la traduction, parce que transférer même cette réflexion-là dans la traduction, c'est difficile, parce que là, on a tout un contexte à prendre en charge. Je n'ai aucune idée de ce que ça pourrait donner. Les textes sur lesquels je travaille en ce moment, qu'est-ce que ça pourrait donner dans la traduction? Ça serait un travail, pour moi, c'est un travail difficile. Pour un traducteur, j'ai l'impression que c'est un cauchemar ou un travail d'une vie où il faudrait faire des choix. Puis pour compléter, moi, je fais, j'écris beaucoup, beaucoup en tenant compte des sonorités. Je souvent, inscrit une espèce de rime intérieure. J'aime beaucoup des espèces de rimes dans les phrases qui se répètent. Puis même des fois, il faut que je me limite pour pas que ça devienne trop juste un jeu de sonorité. Je vais écrire un peu avec mon propre rythme. Mais dans le sens où souvent, je vais commencer une phrase, elle va avoir un certain rythme de sonorité. Et là, je vais être arrivé au bout du sens. J'ai dit ce que j'avais à dire sur le plan du sens, mais il manque quelque chose sur le plan de la sonorité. J'ai un élan à compléter. Et là, je vais chercher le sens qui va me permettre de compléter mon rythme pour avoir la sonorité que je veux. Voilà. C'est... Merci pour la question. Je suis heureux de pouvoir y répondre. <rire> euh, oui, merci beaucoup pour cette question. Je, je vais répondre aussi en français euh, pour la, la première partie. Comme vous avez entendu mon anglais, il est quand même assez approximatif aussi, et donc je suis assez partiellement multilingue, mon allemand n'est pas vraiment meilleur, mon espagnol est un peu bof aussi. Donc je parle plusieurs langues, mais de manière très partielle, donc c'est vrai qu'au niveau littéraire, je, je me sens un peu monolingue, je me sens quand même très francophone dans mon écriture. Euh, donc ça, ce serait pour la première partie, donc je pense que je, je, c'est vrai que je fonctionne vraiment à l'intérieur du français, mais je rejoins vraiment ta réflexion, Gabriel, par rapport aussi à... Par contre, je, je, moi je conçois aussi le français comme une langue multilingue en tant que telle. Il y a plein de langues dans le français. On, on a eu, je crois, une démonstration ici ce soir, en fait. Et, et, et souvent, et donc, pour moi-même, euh, chaque texte que j'écris, j'essaie de trouver une langue, la langue de ce texte, la langue du personnage. Je travaille beaucoup sur des textes en, à la première personne, en jeu. Et chaque fois, c'est, pour moi, une grande partie de ma recherche, c'est. Et ça, je rejoins un peu la deuxième question, trouver une voix, trouver la voix d'un personnage, trouver la voix euh, du coup de ce personnage, la manière dont il ou elle va s'exprimer, la manière dont il ou elle parle. Et bien, par exemple, mon roman Le de l'Espadon, c'est, c'est le monologue d'un poissonnier, et on est vraiment dans une parole assez maladroite, très orale. Très... Donc là, il y avait, par exemple, ce texte-là, je l'ai, en l'écrivant, en faisant de l'écrire, je, je le lisais à voix haute aussi pour l'entendre. C'était vraiment important pour moi d'avoir ce rapport-là. Et... Et globalement, dans ma pratique, je, je fais ça souvent, je, je lis mes textes à voix haute, même pour les retravailler, pour les entendre, c'est vraiment euh, important pour moi. Euh, non, parce qu'en fait, euh, je, partage, je partage ça, en tout cas avec, avec vous deux, peut-être avec toi aussi, euh, Manel, mais c'est euh, la, la voix, en fait. Euh, moi, je réalise que lorsque j'écris, c'est d'abord des voix que j'essaie de traduire en parlant de translation, mais là, il y a déjà comment on retraduit les voix qu'on pourrait entendre, tout en pensant très fort à des personnages et très fort à des lieux. Et tant que je n'ai pas reconnu, en fait, ces voix-là, alors l'écriture n'arrive pas. Donc, en fait, au commencement, c'est pas au commencement était le silence, mais au commencement était d'abord la voix, les voix. Et donc, c'est très important pour moi d'aller écrire in situ, c'est absolument important parce que le premier personnage, hein, c'est vraiment le paysage. Et lorsque j'arrive dans un lieu, comme là c'est le cas pour le Vieux Monde, où je suis restée deux ans en fait à New Orleans, le temps d'entendre toutes ces voix-là, c'est-à-dire c'était les voix des voisines qui parlaient, qui ne me parlaient pas mais qui se parlaient, c'était la voix des cyprès, il y a les cyprès, les arbres qui parlent dans le texte, c'était la voix de l'eau, également, puisqu'on sait que c'est, c'est un endroit où il y a tellement, tellement, tellement trop d'eau. Donc c'était la voix de l'eau, c'était aussi la voix des ancêtres, hein, puisque c'est une terre qui est marquée par l'esclavage, la plantation, ça pue la plantation, littéralement, quand on est à New Orleans, quand on est en Louisiane. Hein. Donc faire remonter déjà toutes ces voix-là, les ramener dans la chambre d'écriture, hein, et une fois que toutes les voix sont là, alors, j'essaie de retrouver la voix que j'avais cru entendre à l'intérieur de moi, de mon personnage. Et là, ça donne quelque chose ou pas. Mais tant que la voix n'est pas là, alors rien ne vient. Et alors, lorsqu'elle est là, je la chante, je la murmure, je, 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 je la possède, cette voix-là. J'essaie de la dompter, j'essaie de la ramener parce que je suis en train de lui dire, tu vois, tu ne vas pas chanter très haut parce que je vais te remettre dans la page, là. Donc c'est une voix qui est sauvage. Donc il va falloir tout mon travail là de romancière 
C'est vraiment, je vais donc quitter cette, cette voie-là qui est pénétrée donc, par tous les espaces hein, que je traverse. Donc c'est d'abord un travail, vraiment, c'est euh, le paysage et l'oraliture. Hein. C'est d'abord ces deux-là, d'abord. Et ce qui fait que souvent, dans mon expérience d'écriture, j'ai eu à dire les textes avant même qu'ils soient imprimés, même systématiquement, parfois des années avant. C'était important pour moi de les remettre là, dans cet espace-là, qui est de toute façon un espace du rituel. Hein. C'était remettre les voix, les faire venir, les faire venir, les faire monter, les faire monter, et ensuite ensuite m'autoriser à publier. Et donc c'est important, c'est pour ça que merci encore, parce que ça me donne, encore quand je dis me rendre mon personnage, c'est que je, je là je l'entends, je l'entends très très fort avec un mégaphone. Donc pour moi c'est extrêmement important. Et comme Gabriel tu viens de le dire, je n'imagine pas, je n'écris pas en pensant à la traduction en anglais, en allemand, ou en espagnol, Jamais, en fait. La seule voix fantôme qui viendrait peut-être m'inspirer, c'est le créole. Le créole que j'entends vraiment comme une voix, une langue cachée, en fait. Donc, elle vient et on le trouve, ce créole, en filigrane dans mon travail. On ne peut pas le détecter si on n'est pas créolophone, mais quand même, on sent qu'il y a une déstabilisation, il y a une danse, comme ça, créole, dans tous mes textes. Eh bien, pour donner suite à ce que tu viens de dire à propos des voix, eh bien, pour moi, c'est très, très différent. Euh, J'écris toujours euh, en me relisant à voix haute. Pour moi, c'est important le rythme, la sonorité. Euh, comme euh, Gabriel aussi, parfois, euh, une phrase peut, me, peut être complète, mais il manque quelque chose sur le plan du rythme. Et, et je vais la réécrire, je vais la retravailler jusqu'à ce qu'elle qu se tienne sur le plan euh, du rythme, mais pour ce qui est de mes personnages, c'est pas une question de... Euh, pour moi, c'est pas de, de trouver la voix de chaque personnage d'abord. La, la voix euh, première, c'est la voix du roman. C est, c est, euh, et et d'ailleurs, dans, dans tous mes premiers romans, et, et jusqu'à la toute fin, j'utilise très peu de dialogue, j'utilise le discours indirect. Euh, dans Skatepark, j'ai commencé à utiliser un peu de dialogue pour avoir des, euh, pour avoir, euh, euh, des personnages qui existent dans le présent du texte aussi. Mais, euh, mais donc, ce ne sont pas... Euh, les, la voix des personnages, elle est dans la narration. C'est dans, dans l'écriture dans que le personnage va trouver sa personnalité. C'est dans, le, dans les résonances entre des images, les, les échos du texte, euh, aux différents niveaux structurels du roman. Et c'est là que, finalement, le, le personnage va acquérir sa personnalité. Et pour ce qui est des... des je, je vais terminer. Pour ce qui est de, de la première question, euh, je, je vis à New York depuis plus de 35 ans. Donc, j'écris dans un milieu complètement anglophone, en français. Je continue d'écrire en français. Et pour moi, c'est bien sûr que je n'écris pas non plus en pensant à une éventuelle traduction. Je n'écris pas en me demandant qu'est-ce que ça donnerait en anglais. Je, le travail de l'écrivain, à mon sens, c'est de s'approprier le plus personnellement possible sa langue, euh, ou, la langue ou une autre langue, mais il faut qu'il y ait un travail, euh, parce qu'il bon, y a la Beckett, il y a le Cove et tout ça. Mais euh, pour moi, c'est les questions de, de m'approprier le plus personnellement possible ma langue. Par contre, j'écris toujours au au croisement d'au de, moins deux langues. Aujourd'hui, on, on, on vit dans un monde où je crois qu'on n'écrit plus dans une seule langue et on n'écrit plus depuis un seul lieu. Merci beaucoup pour votre réponse et merci à tous pour venir aujourd'hui et pour vos questions et pour ces textes magnifiques et les textes de traduction. Et à 8 o'clock, nous allons avoir un show par um, Gabrielle, qui sera un show à Studio 151, qui est le festival. Merci.